just stop and think about how you consume content on a daily basis. My guess is it has probably changed materially over the last 10 years. I can remember vividly just 10 years ago when I'd get on the train every morning, I had to have my paper newspaper. It was just something I had to do. It was a ritual. It was like getting my latte in the morning. But today when I think about how I consume content and it's almost subconscious, I go to my phone. It is the portal into all the different news sources, things like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. I use news aggregators. It's actually one of my favorite things, things like Flipboard or the new Apple News, which is fantastic. I also use Twitter. I spent a lot of time flipping through Twitter and finding some amazing stories that I would never would find otherwise. And I even find some stories on Facebook, believe it or not. And so what I would say is how we consume content is having a huge impact on traditional newspapers like the Dallas Morning News. And there are so many stats that I could throw at you that demonstrate the impact that digital has had on traditional newspapers. But let me just throw out a few from Pew Research. Advertising revenue has experienced its greatest drop since 2009, falling nearly 8% in 2014 to 2015. In 2014, newsroom employment declined 10% more than any year since 2009, and the newspaper workforce has shrunk by 20,000 positions, or 39%, in the last 20 years. Think about how many lost jobs that is. And there are 126 fewer newspapers, fewer daily newspapers in 2014 versus 2004. And if that is not an industry in change, an industry in disruption, I don't know what is. 80% of the revenues of the newspaper industry came from print advertising in newspapers. Mm -hmm. The other 20% was circulation revenue, okay? That 80% piece uh, declined uh, by 50% in less than six years. That's a, a pretty remarkable thing for an industry to continue to be able to be actually operating in the face of that kind of rapid decline. And by the way, the total decline in revenues in the newspaper industry has not abated. It has continued to go down for the four more years after that. So you're probably now at somewhere around half to less of the total revenues of an industry gone in less than a decade. And yet, you know, most of the industry is still operating. Welcome to Resilient, where we hear stories from leaders on risk, crisis, and disruption. And we get those stories by meeting our guests on their home turf. My name is Mike Kearney the leader of Deloitte Strategic Risk Practice. But for this, I have the unbelievable good fortune of sitting down with some incredible leaders who really define what it is to be resilient. And I'm hoping you're enjoying these conversations. We are really getting an eclectic group of leaders in so many different industries and experiences and walks of life. I'll tell you for me personally, it is the treat of my career. And today I'm at the historic Dallas Morning News building downtown Dallas, Texas. And I'll tell you, it is incredible. If you've ever walked into their building, it is magnificent. In the lobby, you see all of these posters of their Pulitzer winning articles. And today I'm talking with Jim Maroney, the CEO of A.H. Below, the owner of the Dallas Morning News. And Jim has been at A.H. Below and the Dallas Morning News for the last 15 years. So to say that he has been in the thick of change within publishing is a big understatement. And I'm really looking forward to talking to a leader who has gone through all of this disruptive change over the last 15 years, and he still is at the same organization, leading it, transforming the business through this change. My guess is he's gonna have a lot of crazy, interesting insights on leading an organization through change. And he may even throw a story of crisis in as well. So from downtown Dallas, Texas, this is Resilient. So, you know what, Jim, I always like starting these conversations out with a fun fact. And one of the things that I had read and doing my research was that you were publisher of the year in 2003. And I had also read that you were almost a newcomer in many respects to publishing. You were um, in a career before that. What did that mean to you, being recognized so quickly coming into publishing? Well, I mean, I was very flattered and very honored uh, to get it. I don't think I actually had it in perspective. I didn't really know about the award uh, and so when I was told that I was going to be publisher of the year, I thought that has to be good, but I really didn't know, was this 
you know, three people in a store giving, you know, pulling a name out of a hat or was it something more? And when I learned that it was editor and publisher of the magazine and they go through a pretty good process of nomination and review, I, I was very flattered. And I really, the best part was that I thought it would help us as a company um, attract more, you know, talent and attention because they say, well, this is a more forward-looking um, organization than a lot of the newspaper companies, even then, that were being criticized for sort of looking backwards and not looking forwards. And what, it, what do you think contributed to it? That well, forward-looking element to yeah, it? Yeah, it was or? the forward-looking. We had started three um, companies in uh, 2003. We started a special edition for Plano, which is a very large part of the sort of greater Dallas-Fort Worth DMA. Uh, we started a Spanish language um, mm. newspaper called Aldea that's still being published today, and we started another company whose name I'm not co- recalling at the moment. <laughs> but that that's really what it was. That 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 was unfortunately unusual. That uh, a newspaper company uh, would have three brand new sort of startup. Uh, publications uh, all in in one year and I think that's why I got chosen that's kind of in your DNA we're going to talk a lot about your (laughs) entrepreneurial style but before we jump into that let's learn a little bit about you so where did you grow up I actually grew up in Dallas Texas you did yeah you did and then give me a little bit of back you about yourself you know your interests when you were younger where you went to school well, uh, I went to a Catholic uh, boys' school run by Hungarians, uh, Hungarian monks, who actually came to the United States uh, during two times. One during uh, World War II, which was more the suppression of uh, Catholicism through the Nazi occupation, mm-hmm. and they were trying to uh, get to a place where they could practice their religion uh, freely. And then in what is, of course, known as the Hungarian Revolution, the basically three-day uprising against the Russians, when uh, several of them fl- uh, fled the hung- Hungarian borders and really were sort of diving into American embassies. Some of them killed before they could actually get a- get through the gates. Others of them then uh, did make it and got asylum in the United States starting up in Wisconsin, and then came down to Dallas to help start the University of Dallas. Uh, And then what their typical vocation had been was secondary education. So they started a prep school um, uh, out in Irving uh, that started with a fourth grade, they call it preform, and then all the way through eighth form. And I was the uh, fifth uh, graduating class. They started with uh, fourth and fifth grade, and they added one each year. So I was sort of the fifth of those classes added, and we graduated, uh, you know, nine years later. So I have to ask. So I went to Christian Brothers High School okay. uh, in yep. Northern California. My son goes there now, yep. and if you were to ask me to recite the history, I don't think I could do half as good a job as you did. So it obviously made an impression on you. Made a real impression. The uh, the monks out of Cistercian have a lot to do with. Uh, I feel like how my life, uh, you know, kind of was formed and so forth. They were very important to me. Um, I have nothing but great uh, memories. I uh, served on their school board for. 25 years more i can't even remember wow both our sons uh went to cistercian uh there's the cistercian monks uh, an order that's over 900 years old founded in in uh in france and uh they're the only cistercian school and cistercian uh you know full uh abbey in uh in the united states but there are plenty of them over in in europe and other parts of the world and then after that you went to Stan- my neck of the woods stanford yes, right yeah so did uh, did four years at stanford loved every single bit of it met some of the most uh, incredible people some very good friends of mine still today and uh, uh, loved every bit of it and then fortunately I've had two of our children um, go there so that's been fun and then and then you got an MBA and one of the questions I'm curious about is why why an MBA when you went into broadcasting and publishing did you know that you ultimately wanted to uh, run a company well I think that that I knew I wasn't planning to be on the journalism, the you know editorial side of the business. Uh, even when I worked in summers, um, I worked uh, really on more of the the business side of the business, if you will, maybe in promotions. I did run a board. I did do some production on a on a radio station that we all owned here. But mostly, I knew that I wasn't going to be a a reporter. Um, uh, though I loved the business and I loved the news and the journalism, that just wasn't my calling. So I figured if I was going to do this, I needed to go get more of a business side degree and, and come into the business that way. So now you're the CEO of AHBLO. Um, I think many people may know the companies that AHBLO 
owns. Mm-hmm. Can you just give a little background on the organization? So, um, in fact, next year we'll celebrate the 175th anniversary of the A.H. Bilo Corporation, which is the longest continually operating business in the state of Texas. It was founded by a uh, Colonel Alfred Horatio Bilo. Uh, he started the Galveston News uh, in 1842. Um, before uh, when Texas was still a republic. And, uh, and then uh, he uh, uh, sent uh, a guy named G.B. Dealey uh, up to Dallas in 1885 uh, because the railroad was coming through uh, uh, Dallas. At that time, Galveston was probably the number one port city of Texas and and had a neck and neck race with Houston Mm. until the great 1900 hurricane, which was at the time the greatest natural disaster in the history of the United States, basically took Galveston out of the race and and Houston became the port city of of importance in Texas. But he got this, uh, uh, the Dallas Morning News started uh, by sending this young man up here uh, while he continued to run the Galveston paper. He eventually sold the Galveston paper and consolidated up here. Here um, with uh, GB Dealey, uh, and that's always been the AH Below Corporation. Uh, uh, over time, it, it grew and, and acquired uh, radio stations uh, here in Dallas, uh, television stations, eventually um, television stations around the United States. And uh, in uh, 2008, the company split into two separately traded public companies, one called Belo Corp, that was all the broadcasting stations, Mm -hmm. and one called uh, A.H. Belo, that was the newspaper company, uh, which is what it is today. And there was the Dallas Morning News, the Providence Journal, and the Riverside Press Enterprise. Um, We sold the Providence paper and the Riverside paper, and today focused just on the Dallas Morning News. But I also should acknowledge we have a separately owned uh, uh, run paper in Denton, which is for those are from Dallas, it's just north of uh, Dallas, called the Denton Record Chronicle. But basically, the company is the Dallas Morning News and all the things that it owns and operates here in Dallas. So, Jim, one of the things I want to really focus on during this conversation is all the change that has been going on over the last, I think you've been CEO for 15 years now, right? Yeah. Since 2001. Well, okay, let me back that up. I've been publisher and CEO of the Dallas Morning News yep. since 2001. I became the uh, chairman and CEO of A.H. Belo in 2013. 2013. Yeah, so... But you're market. still an expert on all the change that has happened over have, the last I have, 15 years. I have years. lived through all of it. So, so one of the things that I spend a lot of my time thinking about, um, and we focus quite a bit on this podcast, is just all of the changes that are happening in the world today. And I think probably publishing, there's probably no better example of an industry that is going through change right before our eyes. And maybe... Um, you know, people use technology to get their news today, so they probably recognize. But can you maybe give a firsthand account of just coming from 2001 to where we are today, just the change that you have seen and how it's begun to change your okay. business model? Well, I'll give you a little anecdote. So I was trying to put not only the decline in the revenues in the newspaper industry into perspective, I was also trying to give our all of our employees a little bit of a, a good feeling like, well, Okay, it's bad, but it's not as bad as. So I went and looked at the decline in revenues by percent for the newspaper industry, and I put up against that Kodak and Blockbuster, mm. figuring, okay, well, you know, we'll, well, you know, we, of we'll, course we're better than that. Yeah, right? we're, yeah, misery loves company, <laughs> but we're better than that. Actually, our rate of decline was worse than both Blockbuster and Kodak. And I said, well, that's not going to work. And uh, so what's what's happened is, and I think this is a remarkable story for the whole newspaper industry to some degree, 80% of the revenues of the newspaper industry came from print advertising in newspapers. Mm-hmm. The other 20% was circulation revenue, okay? That 80% piece uh, declined uh, by 50% in less than six years. So if you do the math, that meant, you know, 40% of your total revenue just went away Eviscerated. In, yeah. in, in, inside of six years. That's a, a pretty remarkable thing for an industry to continue to be able to be actually operating in the face of that kind of rapid decline. And by the way, the total decline in revenues in the newspaper industry has not abated. It has continued to go down for the four more years after that. So you're probably now at somewhere around half to less of the total revenues of an industry gone in less than a decade, and yet 
you know, most of the industry is still operating. What's interesting is uh, in my pre-work, I actually uncovered an article in 2004 when you were talking about this. Yeah. When did you actually start to see this coming on? Did you see it, it was 2004, the watershed? My guess is probably not. You no, probably saw it before I, 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 don't, I think that, that it really was in uh, 2007, we were down over 2006. And from my days in, in over-the-air broadcast television, you might have a down year, but then you just said, oh, great, easy comps, right? We'll come, it'll come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, it's going to yeah. come back the next year, and right. it's going to come back big because we were even slightly down, right. right? Well, 07 was down, and I think actually down a little bit over 06. And then 08 was already going down before, before the stock market crash of oh, 08. Yep. You know, okay, so, yeah. so it's, yeah, so it's going down, uh, and I'm thinking, we've done down on down on down you know, what, what is that all about? And I started thinking, wait a minute, what if this is just going to continue? What if this is not going to, you know, sort of bounce back, bottom out, pick your, your, your term? And it really was then, of course, the 08 market crash and the virtual depression of 09, part of 10, that it said, look, this is, this is not coming back. Uh, at least we're going to plan our strategy around this will not come back. And in fact, it will at least continue to go down as much as it's been going down, or it may go down more. And we have to build a strategy in order to be able to survive and uh, live through that kind of, uh, you know, permanent secular change. And I think so. I think it was kind of that 08, even before the market sort of went to hell, that we, we said, Hey, we're we're in something that's that's different here. This isn't just cyclical. When when you look at your peers at other organizations, did they share that same opinion at that time? No, I, I I'm sure some did. Most didn't. Most didn't. Most had been in the business, you know, for a lifetime. I'd been in it for about six or seven years, and I didn't know nearly as much as they knew. But maybe the good part was that I looked at this and said, "This is just odd." I mean, I'll give you I'll give you a fascinating statistic. I took over this job in June of 2001, okay? Uh, we, used, we have what was called an employment section in the newspaper. Every newspaper had them. Our employment section in 2000 did $120 million of revenue. That one section published every day of the year, okay? I come in in June uh, of 2001. I take the job. I'm inside the company. I didn't go a bunch of due diligence. The, the CEO asked me to come in and be publisher and I didn't know why but I said well if that's what you want me to do I'll go do it sure. and he, he wanted me to do two things fix the accounting and finance department and fix the sales department and he said then we'll have you do something else so I'm sitting here two weeks in the job and I'm looking at the financials and I go wait a minute we did 120 million dollars in employment revenue last year and at the end of June we're forecasting to have done 30 million so if we do that again in the second half, that's 60 million. That's a 50% decline in one year. What the hell is going What's on? Going on, wow. So I talked to all the people that are a lot smarter than me because I hadn't been in the business, and they said, "Oh, it's cyclical." And I'm thinking to myself, a 50% decline in one year is cyclical. But it was, you know, the dot-com crash of 2001. Right. Well, really, what it was, it was monster. And they came in and said, "Look." We had the most efficient marketplace at the time for clearing jobs. We brought the most people with the most jobs to one place, this section, and, and cleared the jobs. Monster comes in and says, I'll put a lot more people with a lot more information in a much less, uh, less much more frictionless encounter, and I'm going to charge a third of what they're charging. And it completely decimated the business. But we were all still saying, well, it's cyclical. It's not secular but it was secular and never came back. It so, just kept declining. So it's interesting that you say that because to you as an outsider, relatively new to the organization, you could see it. It's a question I was going to ask you later, but I think there are examples, and you mentioned some of the companies before, where it's staring them right in the face, like change is a common. And I think people see it, but they don't internalize it and they don't change. Why do you think that is? I don't know if it's, I don't know, Michael, is it, is it optimism? Is it not wanting to acknowledge how bad something is? It, it, you don't want to face it because you know what it means you're going to have to do. Uh, 
Is it because you've lived through some declines before that have turned around and come back? Uh, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for it, but I do think there is an advantage to coming into an industry as opposed to having grown up in it when this happens. Because for you, it's first time, it's different, it's new, and you say, boy, given my experience in other industries, this is catastrophic. This is not normal. This is not cyclical. This is something else, and we need to go figure out what it is and what it really means versus, hey, we've lived through some declines before. You know, it's it's exogenous to us. It's not our industry. It was the... It was the dot com crash, and so right. you know a lot of jobs that we got created and, and, and so forth were going away, and uh, and there was a little bit of a recession. So uh, I wish I knew Michael because I don't because look, I mean again, um, this is uh, um, for all the Star Trek fans. So there's the Borg, and it's this one <laughs> central consciousness, right? And the longer you get into a company the more you become part of that just unified consciousness and you can't get yourself out of it. The first month I was here, I interviewed 60 people from every single level of the organization and I asked every one of them the same question for 60 minutes because I think that, that companies are self-diagnostic. If you really will ask enough people, take enough information down, right. you'll, you'll begin to hear what's the problem. I still remember this one guy, I always had ended with, well, what is the question or what didn't I let you say that you want to say to me? And he looked at me, and I'll never forget it, and he said, don't become one of us. And I think he was trying to tell me there was already a, a culture of collective thinking and we're just too good. Because, I mean, boy, the newspaper industry, I mean, it was in a virtual monopoly position in marketplaces, and it it was creating cash hand over fist, and I think – they figured that they just could do no wrong. And I guess I can't blame them because if you look at the track record of financial growth, you know, from the mid eighties up through 2000, it was remarkable. It was incredible. And I think there's, I mean, it, what's interesting to me, especially in today's day and age, things are changing for every industry so fast. And the learning that I'm taking from that is that you, 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 you there is value in bringing people who don't have a dog in the hunt into the conversation because they may challenge some of those biases, quite frankly, I yep. think that many people that are entrenched in the business have, and they may ask those questions that maybe others aren't asking. Yep. I think and that's the, fascinating. And yeah. then something you and I talked about when you were here in Dallas, I think if the CEO is open to hearing that right. and opening to trying to test that, then that voice of that person is going to make a difference. But if that person who comes in isn't a CEO and they're a level or two down in the organization, probably everyone's going to say, you know, Bob, Mary, you, you just don't get it. You haven't been around here long enough. You haven't been in the industry. You'll see that this will all sort of come back and work its way back. And and then this person is sort of marginalized that way. You know, I'm glad you uh, reminded me of that exchange because I had totally forgotten about it. But can you maybe just explain, and now we're going off off topic a little, but I think it's important because remember when we were together, you would explain how you would almost invite um, the devil's advocate or somebody that has a difference of opinion or executive sessions. Maybe just share that with the group because well, I think great you, way of getting at truth. Right over there, you can see a book with a red uh, back to it on top of that little table. Yep. Uh, yep. Well, right I, there. I, I yep. think I mentioned you, that I believe is the most important book ever written for CEOs or anybody way up in an organization. And it's a book that we all were read to us probably uh, as kids. It's The Emperor's New Clothes. Because a CEO or anyone high up in an organization, and I always say, I can get people in this company, I can line them up around the block, and they will come up to me and tell me exactly what it is they think I want to hear. Right. That, how do they make me feel good? Tell me something I want to hear. And I say, you know, in the emperor's new clothes, my kingdom for one person that will come up and say, boss, you know that idea of yours? You're kind of buck naked on that one. You, you really, I know you think this is a good idea, but it's, let me, can I explain to you why it's not? And I think it is so difficult to develop a trust with your people where they feel really comfortable coming in and being brutally honest with you about what they think. Um, I had a boss named Ward Huey, and I think we developed that kind of trust. But before I would go into one of these, I'd say, I'd say, Ward? And he'd say, yeah, I go, um, permission to speak freely. And he'd go, oh, God. Here it comes. Yeah, here it comes. But, but then he knew 
I was going to tell him something that he didn't want to hear, probably, or I was going to disagree with him, but it, but he was respectful of it, and it didn't, he didn't always agree with me, didn't always say, well, boy, that's right, but he let me say it, and I never felt like I couldn't say it, and I, I even struggled today. We just spent a whole off-site day talking about how can we really have open, honest communication that has conflict in it and and work through the conflict and come up with answers without people feeling like you're offending them, you're attacking them, you're hurting their feelings. It's hard. How, how do you, and I don't know if you even think about this, but do you think about how you inculcate risk taking in your culture? Is that something that as a CEO you so, can do? So I'll, I'll, I'm sorry for all the stories, but I, I once went to hear my dad who uh, t- talked to a group of MBAs, yet to be graduated MBAs. And he said, I'm gonna go make this talk. You might wanna come listen. And so his talk could all be boiled down to one thing. Uh, He said, all of you out there are more than likely one of two kinds of people. You're an organization person or you're an entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur and you go to work for an organization, it's going to drive you crazy. And if you're an organization person trying to be an entrepreneur, you're probably going to fail. So try to figure out which one of these people you are and then align yourself accordingly. Well, I probably didn't take his advice because I, I think I'm more entrepreneurial, but I've always worked in an organization and, and it has been frustrating uh, at times. But I think what you do then is you have to bring in some other entrepreneurial mm. people. You have to convince some entrepreneurial person that inside an organization, they can still practice some of that entrepreneurial instincts that they have. Uh, because the natural, really natural entrepreneurs are not going to come work for an organization. They don't want a boss. They want to go do their own right. thing. And and yet, I think you can find people with um, entrepreneurial instincts by looking at what they've done and in, in their uh, career, not just the experience they've had, but talk to them about. So, you know, did you ever uh, get involved in starting uh, a new product in your company? Did you ever uh, uh, do anything to improve a product that you already have? Did you ever do uh, M and A? You know, things that that might allow them to express their creativity. And, uh, and you try to find some of those people. I don't think you can have them. You can't have a whole you know, group of them as your direct reports as a CEO. You need to have just, some organization. Yeah, yeah, you've got to have some people that are keeping the train on the tracks and not trying to get too far off. And I think then if you're me, um, you have a very good CEO who you respect and you listen to. Mm-hmm. And when in this case she says, this is not a good risk you know this is not a good use of our capital uh you you probably should really um uh think long and hard before you you know go do that same thing on the with a good general counsel who says hey it's not necessarily the risk per se in the business but let me tell you some things that that from a legal standpoint you may be opening yourselves up to that you might not want to do and make make this thing look worse so i think you you Really put yourself with some people who are probably not is not so entrepreneurial, but they're very smart. They care very much about the welfare of the company. They want it to grow, but they want it to grow smartly, and, and they act as a good counterweight. And you have to, you have to respect them because if you don't, they'll they'll leave, and and then you'll fill your whole place up with cowboys. And I don't think that if, unless you're again an entrepreneurial company, you're a bunch of wildcatters that are going to go out and drill oil wells to see if they hit one. That's it's not good for an organization like this. You know what you're bringing up is there's so much focus, I think, when you're hiring people, especially for executive level roles. We look at those hard skills. You know, is he the best finance person or strategy person? But what you're getting at is there's almost a layer beneath that, and that's really about their almost their disposition as a person. Are they a risk taker? Are they more about organizing? Are they an integrator? Whatever it may be. But it's almost in some respects, as important to look at those underlying kind of traits of who they are, I hear you yeah. saying, as their hard skills yeah. that and make them. My first question when I hire anybody at this level is from the outside, I go, why do you want to come work for the newspaper industry? Are you crazy? Do you know how, how bad things are? Do you know how hard this is? So what are they, they're and, like, what? No, no, they look at me. And, I, and, and then the answer I get from the ones that I'm interested in hiring is, you know what? I know how bad it is. And I like fixing things. I like being the one that overcame a challenge. That right. doesn't mean they're necessarily entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, but 
they they don't want to come be a run manager. They want to be a change manager. They right. want they want to participate and they want to say, "Hey, I took the I took the the team that finished at the bottom of the league and took them to the top." Instead of as opposed to, "Well, hey, I came in, they were already at the top. I got to celebrate being at the top." There are people that want to you know, they want they want that that sort of uh, um, great feeling that comes from doing something that that's hard as opposed to maybe easy. So, um, and so that's that's the first question I ask. And I, I've hired uh, a CFO came from never in the publishing business. Uh, my C uh, uh, CMO and also uh, chief digital officer came from Nokia. And I was like, she had a great job there. And I was like, why? Yeah. You know, what do you want? Why do you? This is this is this. Is, do you not know how hard this is? Do you know how many people probably rather not be in this industry? You know, what I mean, like, like, God, if they could get out, they'd go out. But they, they said, oh, I know, I know what I'm, in, I know what I'm in for. And I go, okay. And you know, you know what it is? We did, um, we did research. I had mentioned this on the podcast before, but it's, it's probably one of the, my favorite projects I've ever been involved with. We had a, a simple question uh, that we asked, where we said, how do you make good projects great? And so we went out and we studied some of the most iconic projects ever. So, you know, the iPhone, yeah. um, John Landau and uh, not the Titanic, what was Avatar, Avatar. Uh, the, uh, the folks that uh, revolutionized NASCAR pit crews, like all these crazy different projects. And the only thing that cut across all of them was just one thing, what? cause. Purpose. Cost, purpose. And so I think what you're tapping into, it's it's you're finding people that have a greater cause. It's not just about earning a paycheck. It's about making an impact by turning this around. Yeah. And, you know, I'll say this, and I can't tell you that each of them said this at the time, but one of the great uh, privileges of running a news organization is that you uh, – can make a real difference in the life of the community you live in and that begins to seep into the the sort of the soul of people here the news people come at it that's the reason they're doing what they're doing right but then a a, a katie murray my cfo begins to say wow i i'm i'm doing something more than making widgets and maybe making really good widgets and so when a shooting happens here like on july the 7th and five police officers are shot and killed we're the ones explaining to the city what's happening and then eventually how it happened and finally why it happened and what does it mean going forward and you all have a sense of sharing and helping to bring sort of order to chaos in people's mind and in the in the city bringing it together convening it to sort of go through the catharsis of getting rid of this uh sort of terrible tragedy and people people really appreciate that but that's often more once they're here unless it's a news person and that's why they come here right that's why they stay yeah so so i'm going to this quote based on what you just said you said and this is a quote hopefully i got it right as an industry we got barrels of whoop ass left <laughs> did you say that yeah i uh i was i love that quote by the way i had to use it <laughs> i was uh, there's a tradition that the outgoing chairman of the national of the Newspaper Association of America, now it's renamed. And uh, anyway, this is my going out and they give a talk. And, you know, our industry just felt like, I think there were so much, so many parts of our industry that felt like, you know, we just can't do anything right. And, and this, everything's, you know, going against us and, and you know, woe is me and, uh, you know, life's hard and it's awful and so forth. And I just wanted to say, hey, y'all, you know, we got barrels of whoop ass left. I mean, we aren't nearly out of this fight yet. We got a lot that we can bring to the table. And so I wanted to put it in a little Texas colloquialism to kind of, you know. So what was your reaction? Oh, I got, oh, for the next three days. Standing ovation? You well, I don't, it. they give you a standing ovation <laughs> whether you're boring or not, you know, because, you know, you're the outgoing chairman. So I didn't, do, but I did, I mean, literally in the elevator, in the bathroom, in the hallway. Oh, Get out of the world, whoop ass, you know, and I, I thought, oh, and it, I literally, I received an award last two weeks ago, and the guy said, yeah, and so I'm giving the award to that guy that said, we still have a lot of whoop ass left, and I thought, it's all I'm ever going to be known for is whoop ass, but I Evocative guess Evocative okay. language. Yeah, captures yeah, no, you say something, yeah, so anyway. So talk about that transformation, because I think that's one thing you have taken a lot of risks on, you're bullish yeah. on, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to that quote. Why are you so bullish on on you know the future of publishing? What are you doing as an organization? And I, one of the things I read too, I'm sorry, I'm throwing so many things yeah. at you, but I also read 
um, that that you're not even sure where it's going to end up, which I think is fascinating. Yep. Meaning, what's the end game? But you're riding the wave. Yeah. So, well, I mean, we've been riding the wave into the beach here for about a decade, all right. of us, you know. Uh, but we look. We made it through in in three years. Our advertising revenues were down seven percent, seventeen percent, and twenty five percent. I mean, just try that on for a moment. I thought, man, we've we've made it through that. Now that took a massive amount of restructuring, right, to do that, just sure. to get through it, to stay profitable, right? But I said, if we can get through that, uh, what is it that we can't get through? I mean, we just literally, if you, I don't know you don't add percentages, but you're talking about 40% of your your biggest revenue bucket going away in, in, in three years. I mean, most people are, you know, people, the flag's up, surrender, we're out of business, we're upside down. So I just said, if we can do that, we can, you know, we can do almost anything. And, uh, and so I said, you know, y'all, we're <laughs> our number one assumption. It's going to continue to go down. Now, what are we going to do about it? Because everything we do has to be about raising new and incremental revenues. That's that. Don't talk to me about anything else. New and incremental revenues. On our next biggest bucket of revenue was circulation. Was people paying us for the newspaper? Mm-hmm. We had an elasticity study said there was a tremendous amount of elasticity in the price newspaper because they never raised the price newspaper because it was all about the advertising dollars. The more copies you could get out there, the lower price you priced them, the more you could raise your – well, that all broke in about 2009. So on May the 1st of 2009, um, we raised the price of the newspaper by 40 percent to every single – person that took the newspaper and more to people that lived more than 100 miles out that we delivered the paper to. And all of my colleagues said, well, call me, you know, in a couple of months to tell me how that went. Sure. And even some people in here were like, are, are you crazy? And I said, well, wait a minute. It's 2009. We're heading into a depression. We just finished a year when our ad revenues were down 17%. They look like they're going to be down 25%. Exactly what do we have to lose? You know, I mean, really, at this point, it, it, this was desperation as much as anything else. And yet, yet we had data. I had a, a study done by Bain or McKinsey that, that it was from about two years ago, three years ago, that I pulled out and it said, wow, you've got all this inelasticity. You could raise the price of your newspaper. So I went and looked at it and it said, if we raise the price by 40%, we lose 12% of the, the volume. So you just do the math. Yeah. So do the math. Yeah. Rate times volume, you know, 40 up, 12 down, big big total revenue increase. And sure enough, we lost, I think, 14% of our volume. We took the rate up by 40%. And today, this is public information, in 2005, we had $42 million of circulation revenue and we, we produced 500,000 copies, you know, on average. Mm-hmm. Today, now, 10 years later, say 2015, we had $80 million of revenue for 250,000 copies. Twice the revenue, half the copies. Do not only the math on the revenue increase, but on the expense decrease of making the same, uh, twice as much money for half amount of, like, it's like saying I raised the price of Coke by two times and I'm selling half, I mean, I, I raised it by 40%. I'm selling half the product and I'm making twice as much money. That was, that turned out to be, you know, a good bet, but it was a, you know, wasn't anybody else in the industry interested in doing it until we went on the road and said, here are the results. And I was trying to talk to the industry saying, this is a, this is something you can this do. This is a it, simple it, it, strategy. Simple that strategy works. That, yep. that works. And you all have it because you, none of us raised the price for a newspaper. And we did a conjoint study. We traded off, you know, what it, would it take for you to – what price would you quit reading your newspaper? You'd cancel it? At that time, we were charging um, $18 a month. We had people in the study, you know, like 2,000 subscribers, you know. We had people still left in at $100 a month, five times what they would have been paying at that time, saying, I still won't give up the paper. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, these people are going to die with this newspaper in their cold, dead hand. I mean, they're, just, they're not going to give it up for anything, so we can raise the price, and we did. So talk about the, the transformation into digital and, and where your mind's at with that right now. Yeah, well, I, I was fortunate to get the opportunity to start um, uh, a, a digital company for our company in 1998 called Below mm-hmm. Interactive. And we took all of our newspapers and all of our TV stations and we put them online and we 
control the operations online. Now, the Dallas Morning News already had a, a somewhat, for that time, active website. But most of the TV stations, for instance, they had PDFs of their anchor people up. That's what You went to WFA.com, you got a PDF. Right. So we were able to really start, you know, learning about, you know, putting things out on the web and how people would interact with them and what made a difference and so forth. So it gave me a little bit of a, of a learning curve that was pretty steep um, that way. So flash forward to today, um, you know, three or four things. Uh, Facebook rules the world. They have the most data uh, and they get the best results uh, for advertisers because they have such incredible data that, you know, when you're looking for the red-headed, left-handed golfer who likes to play only in Florida and California in the warm months, they know who those people are because they've got that data and they right. can pinpoint, they can make your advertise work. Now, we use Facebook for our customers to get them results too, but I'm just saying, and then today, um, I bet you most of your uh, – media companies um, that are aggressive are getting uh, 20 to 30 percent of their traffic th through what's called the side door through social and uh, and particularly through Facebook so Facebook could be contributing as much as 30 percent of your audience is coming through Facebook, through Facebook to you you know linking back to your site through Facebook they are they are an incredible force and it is a little bit scary because they should and do I guess you know operate in their own self-interest right i mean they're a publicly traded company and and uh and so you you get so beholding to them in some ways you worry a little bit about well what if they which they do they change the algorithm and suddenly your the news feed is as important as what m your uncle and aunt you know uh, are uh putting on uh you know posting on your site or something and we have to sort of we we have to sort of sit back and just watch that happen and then try to adapt to it so in our industry today i think there's a there's several raging debates one is how far do you go in making yourself uh sort of beholden to the platforms the 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 googles the snapchats the instagrams the facebooks how much do you get in in bed with them and and become dependent upon them you can see the Washington Post for instant articles on Facebook went all in. Put everything on there. Everything out there. there. Yep. New York Times said, we'll put in 10, 12, 14 articles a day. We're going to sort of walk before we run on this. So that's one debate, and we're still debating it here. I'm, I'm concerned about it. We are experimenting with it, but we did not go all in. Uh, the next thing, of course, it's all mobile. I mean, the, the desktop traffic uh, hasn't just gone down as mobile's gone up, but mobile has surpassed it. Uh, for most most websites, you're going to be doing uh, more than 50% of your traffic that, you know, maybe five years ago was 80% desktop. And the desktop, I think, will begin to fall back even further in terms of at least percent because it's all going to go mobile. So you've got to be, you know, doing what you have to do mobile. I think that the uh, Washington Post is proving that how fast you load is incredibly important and they just keep seeming they keep trying to get faster and faster to where you know they're below a second you know in load time i don't know how much how much, how much lower, faster you can go how yeah. much faster you can go but i think that's it and i and and then maybe the biggest thing and the most important thing is people used to come to us you know or we put their the news on their doorstep but they or their driveway and 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 we took that to them but we we gave them one package a day to what, what we thought they should read and we delivered it to them when they when we wanted to deliver it to them and they just had to accept that today they want the news to come to them they want the news to be personalized for them they don't want just what everybody else gets uh they want it on their phone at noon they want it on their uh tablet at uh at nine o'clock at night uh they want it to all form fit you know that particular some of them want to get more of their stuff through twitter some of them want to get it through facebook you really have to go where the consumer is and give them the right content through the right channels at the right time. And there are so many channels, so many platforms. When you're a single media company like ours, you know, one big property as opposed to either a huge big company or a company with lots of other 
um, media properties, it's hard to serve all of those channels, all those platforms, and do it with the right content at the right time. We're trying hard, but that's where it's going. That's where it is, and that's where it's going to continue is, to go. Is there a challenge of diluting? It, do the platforms dilute your brand? Meaning, well, this is a big question. Yeah, yeah. That, so, so how visible is your brand within these right. um, uh, platforms? Uh, a lot of them are walled garden, where you don't link back out, like instant articles. You don't link back out. You read it there. Now, you can have your logo there. But is the consumer saying, well, this is really Facebook giving me this information, or is it the Dallas Morning News or kind of both? And I do think one of the reasons that we're alive today in this industry after all the disruption is because we still have strong brands. And I think we have to be real careful, Michael, that things that we may do that are building traffic may be also um, diminishing our brand, and that might not be a good trade-off. You know, one of the, then I'm going to pivot a little, um, given the fact that you have taken so many bold risks, one of the things that always interests me about organizations when they're looking at kind of that next big acquisition or divestiture or new strategy is they, they, they oftentimes look at what are the risks associated with making that decision. But, but what I find very few CEOs talk about is the risk of not making that decision. Is that something that you ever contemplate, meaning like, okay, I understand that the, the choice that's before me is fraught with risks. But if I don't do this, there's all of these other risks that potentially are out there. Is that ever? Well, I, I, maybe, I, I, yeah. Uh, but I also would say, you know, we are in a probably a little different situation. We've been in an industry uh, with declining total revenues for a decade. The choice of not doing something is a lot less sort of uh, attractive sure. than, than saying, well, because if we don't do anything, it's just going to continue to go the way it's going. So, yeah, I, I still think we look at it and just say how big a risk this is, how, how, what's the probability of succeeding, and maybe more, most importantly, if we do this, is it going to move the needle? Because I do think one of the traps you can get into is doing a whole bunch of little things. And you could succeed at all of them, but when you add them up, it doesn't really move the needle. So if you're going to go take a big risk, do something that's going to, that if you succeed is really going to remove the needle versus you do five things, you don't succeed any of them, and whether you succeed or not, it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, so I think that's um, important. I'll tell you, this is the, the trap, and, and I, I, would love, I would love, I'm sure there's a book written about this somewhere, but I'd love to explore this more. I think there's this trap that happens to disruptive uh, industries and companies, and it's this one. Okay, um, we've got to cut our expenses in order to maintain our profitability, okay? And we know we have to do that, so we go do that, and it's painful, and it's hurtful, and nobody likes it. And then someone says, well, now we've cut the expenses we had to cut to just maintain our profitability, but if we want to go and do some organic growth, we're going to need some some more sort of well, not not external capital, but you know, uh, expenses that you can push through the income statement. I got to go cut more to have that that excess cash to sure. go invest in something and still hit my EBITDA target, say from last year if I was cutting. And there's no there's no will. People said I've just I've gone through all the cutting. I just can't go cut more on the hope that I'm going to invest in something or build something that's going to start returning. And so they go, okay, you're right. We just can't. We, let's hunker down next year, though, where we'll, we'll start investing in these new products. And the same thing happens. Well, revenues are projected to be down again. We've got to take another $10 million out of the business. So it's just a spiral. Just yeah, it, it spirals. Yeah. But the spiral part is then, but that extra $2 million you need to go build a new product no one wants to go cut two million more dollars in people, uh, in in you know other things to fund that organic growth. They just they don't. I've watched it. They don't want to do it. And I think by the time they realize, they because they also keep thinking it's going to get better, right? It's going to bottom out. It's going to get better. Yep. And then five years later, all they've done is cut. They've invested not a dollar in any new. Uh, organic growth or or any uh, sustaining innovation, improving products, right? Because they keep thinking it's going to end, and then they wake up and it's 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 game over. They haven't built anything new. Now they can go to their balance sheet if they have a good balance sheet and buy something, and that's perfectly acceptable. But if they're not buying something and they're not building something, and I think the building part, I've I've watched it, I've watched it with my team. 
they have no appetite for saying, okay, well now if we can go just do two more million dollars of expense cuts, we'll, the, that two million dollars will be available to build a new product or two new products. Jim, we, we've already, we're taking out X number of people, we're, we're, we, we've taken out this and that, we've cut our T&E budget, we've cut all this stuff. I don't have two more million dollars I can cut. Well, you know what? The next year, when you got to cut five million more dollars just to maintain your EBITDA, you go find it. You're going to wish you have gone back to. But the but you also and, wish yeah. you would have put something yeah. in to grow something because maybe you then. And so I think there's. I think if you talk to a lot of disrupted businesses and why they ended up going out of business, it may be that they just are unwilling to make the additional cuts necessary to create, if you will, investment capital into your income statement. So last time we were together. Um, you shared an unbelievable story. Um, it was about um, circulation and advertising revenue, and another newspaper uh, yeah. indicated or was found out that they were um, overcharging yeah. uh, for advertisements. Can you share the story? Because it's, it's, yeah. it's a good one. I still remember I was in New York at an investment uh, conference, and uh, I had heard that a newspaper in the United States had uh, apparently um, – deliberately uh, overstated their circulation. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the amount of your circulation had a lot to do with what you could charge for your advertising, sure. right? Called cost per thousand, so the more thousands you had, so forth. Vested so, interest in overstating circulation. Yeah, more right, more, right. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's, that's yep. exactly what, what yep. it would be. Because yep. uh, it doesn't have that you're not collecting the money for the circulation, but it's the advertising. Yep. So I remember calling up uh, the person head of our circulation and saying, hey, we're not doing any of this, and if we if we are or anything close to it, we need to know because this is you know this is like wow. Well, so he put out a, a message to all of our contractors. They're all we all have, that we don't have we don't have employees. We have contractors that deliver the newspaper, mm -hmm. and he said you know blah 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 blah. Well, the next thing you know, single copy sales start declining on a really like 10 or 12% this week and 10% the next week and 10 and I'm like uh -oh. holy yeah. crap what's going on and it turns out that we had no reconciliation between the contractors who delivered the papers and how many copies they said they sold and they would buy the copies from us and then sell them to a store and make the margin well, there were copies being given to contractors at a penny a piece. Hmm. They, it, like, so they're going to drive to way out places, and this is how they're going to be able to make a profit because they're take they're keeping most of the money themselves, and, sure. and therefore the distribution costs aren't you know are, are covered. Well, we had a contest going on for who could sell the most you know single copy papers, and I went into the guy that was running and I said, you know, I did some back of the envelope math and. You can buy a hundred papers for a dollar, report them as this, and get a trip to Hawaii for you know about fifty bucks, and just buy the papers and foam away. And I, he goes, yeah. And I go, well, <laughs> isn't it possible that that's why you put this edict out? We're going to start trying to reconcile sold and, and return papers, and and maybe they've been buying these papers recording them as sales for the contest but just pitching them in the the dumpster well there's no way we would e were able to ever pin to say who did it because there was no paper trail no interesting there was no piece of paper saying i took 100 papers i returned 50 papers it was just uh, i took 100 papers i paid you you know whatever it cost and then i didn't i didn't do i did not do returns so anyway this was this was a huge deal i mean this was this was news all over the United States and certainly in the newspaper industry. But Jim, before you get into yeah. next steps, you weren't implicated initially. Me? No, 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 oh, not no, you. Oh, not, no, 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 the Dallas Morning. No, I mean, no, this, this was, was this was the the one paper that that I had had already been implicated, and that's when I was in New York and I called the person and I said, "Hey, did you see this? We're not doing this, are we?" And he said, "No, we're not doing this." And I said, "Well." We better be damn certain. You better get all these guys together, and you better tell them that if anybody is caught doing this, it, it's into their job and into everything else. The, the reason why I just wanted to point that out is 
um, this was not a crisis. This was a crisis maybe in the industry, but you had not been implicated, yet you were proactive in starting to try to understand yes, whether or not this was an issue. But it had only been one paper so far at that It wasn't time. even an industry issue, it, then it, it was just industry. one. And, and uh, so then um, we had to start dealing with the fallout. And I think the thing that we did that was so um, smart, and it, I'm not taking credit for it, the CEO at the time, I think really led the charge on this of our whole company, our chairman of our board, said, look, we're going to calculate what our advertisers would have paid us mm -hmm. over about a six month period of time. You know, we, we did, or a year, I think we did one year. We, we don't know how long this is going on, but we said, okay, look, let's say it's been going on a year. If, if, these, if this circulation has now all come out, had been the base instead of the base that was reported, how much less would they have paid us for the advertising? And we calculated it for every advertiser and we said, here's, the amount of advertising you spent with us based on this rate base, here's what it would have been had the rate base been lower where it really should have been because we think these copies were not real copies being sold. Here's the difference, and here's a check. And by the way, you don't have to sign anything saying you still can't sue us. And I think that that last part, not only giving them the, the check with no, no strings, no strings attached, attached yep. they, if they said not enough, sue us. They said, that's great, that's enough, but I'm still going to sue you. We said, you can do anything you want, and, but, but here's, the, here's money. And if you cash a check, there is, you're obligating yourself to nothing. You have, it's yours, and you can do whatever you want after that in terms of coming after us. And so, anyway, we came through it, you know, basically, um, you know, not unscathed because it, was a, it, it hurt the company, it hurt our pride, it hurt our sense of integrity. Um, you hate to be a story that you have to report on about yourself. And by the way, in fact, to be sure that we really were objective with the story, we brought a reporter in from one of our other newspapers and had him come in here and report the story. Wow. So it couldn't look like we were trying to do You're home cooking. You know, yeah, covering our own story and not really telling the whole story. And uh, and so that person came in there, had carte blanche to, to do the reporting and report it uh, and publish it in our newspaper. And uh, I think those kind of things – um, helped us get over something that uh, the other two newspapers, another newspaper eventually had yeah, this, went on for a lot longer and took a lot more uh, damage that they had to, you know, sort of work their way out of for a longer period of time. If you were going, if you could go back into time and you were to go back into time when you were first CEO and you were to give yourself just one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I would have said, uh, don't become one of them. Stay enough outside that you can see secular change for what it is when it happens and not get bought into its cyclical. And I didn't do that. I didn't stay enough as an outsider. I don't think I even recognized how I was sort of becoming part of the the culture of, you know, we're great and we had a great run and we can't do things wrong and it'll all come back and I wish I could have that back so badly. Do you remember the guy that gave you that um, advice or, or answered the question when you did all of those interviews when you first, because it sounds like he's in oh. some respects had a pretty profound impact on no, the way he, he did. And, and, and I, he was the head <laughs> of our uh, North plant uh, at the time and probably one of the guys I would have at least expected to hear this from because he was, you know, an old printing guy you know right. but boy did he he uh he was right and i it, and if you're ever in a disruptive industry i don't i guess can't tell you how important that is last question yeah we named this podcast resilient because we're very interested in what makes a resilient leader and i think the whole notion of resilience in today's day and age with all of the change, the volatile world we live in is probably more important than ever. So when I say that word, resilient leader, it may sound like a consulting word, but what are the characteristics of a resilient leader in your mind or the one characteristic? I think that for me, um, my resiliency comes in two parts. I feel like I have a, a group of people that I can't let down. And I have to get back up off the mat every time and come back to bat for them mm. because I'm the CEO. Now, if they take me out, then that's fine. But as long as I'm here, I owe something to the rest of them to keep fighting as long as I can. And the second part is um, I really do believe that uh, the journalism that we produce at scale, uh, greater than any other news organization in the town by far, 
is such an important part of a durable democracy. I think that the the watchdog journalism we do, um, the way that we try to keep our elected officials, you know, honest and serving the citizens, uh, the fact that uh, the forefathers sort of said, hey, we're going to give you this, you know, First Amendment right not to be, um, you know, uh, overly uh, interfered with by the government. That's a pretty sacred thing. And uh, we have a mission statement actually carved on our wall there. Uh, and it's all about giving the people both sides of every story. And it's about integrity. And it's about trustworthiness. And uh, I think I think that's a, a huge trust. And I think it's, you know, the reason GB Dealey started this paper. And I think it's kept the paper going ever since or the institution. And I feel a real sense of responsibility to that. So that keeps me getting back up off the mat every day, too. Awesome. Jim, okay. thank you Michael, so thank much. You. This All was right. incredible. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible conversation. Um, conversation on leading through disruptive change. I still can't get over the fact that Jim has been at Age Bilo for the last 15 years leading the organization through all this change. I have got some great nuggets, some great quotes that we also heard through that podcast. Um, you know, this has been an incredible journey for me, and I want to thank everybody out there for continuing to listen to Resilient, a podcast that is uh, from Deloitte and produced by our friends at Rivet Radio. And as we've talked about before, you can go to our Deloitte.com site to listen to it, but you can also go to a variety of, of different podcatchers, keyword resilient. And I'd ask if you like this episode, go check out some of our previous episodes. We've got some great interviews with CEOs, board members, and leaders. And what's incredible about this is we've been at this for about six months now, and we're starting to get a treasure trove of great conversations. So go check them out. Also, social media is the way to connect with me. So hit me up on LinkedIn or even Twitter with any comments or recommendations for future guests. What has been, which has been great is I weekly get some incredible guest recommendations and I'm pursuing them. This is what makes the podcast great is getting incredible leaders who define resilient to tell their authentic stories. If you want to catch me on Twitter or LinkedIn, my profile is under Michael Kearney. Last name is spelled K E A R N E Y. And remember, Leaders who embrace risk, improve performance, and are more prepared to lead confidently in the volatile world we live in.